so I'm going to talk generically around uh, sailing from four to seven seas. It's basically an adventure on the high seas, um, made slightly less interesting by being about C++, but hopefully that's interesting for you guys um, and everyone else. Um, so four, seven seas, it's basically we're in a tools talk, yeah? Um, some tools um, that we've been using um, for my company and what they mean, what our experiences with them, some recommendations, learnings will come to the end. Um, so that, that's sort of the, the, the quick summary. Um, this is me. Um, I'm at Scatademic on Twitter. Um, I run a very small software team um, within E3D Skunk Works, which is a, a friend company of a 3D printing company called E3D Online. Um, those of you who have not come across 3D printing, I'm going to throw some of these out if you want to pass them around. My throwing's just as good as... If I throw two, do you want to pass them around? Um, this is just an example, if you haven't come across it before, of 3D printing. Printing plastic. Um, plastic focus is what E3D Online does as its focus. They build hardware parts to make world-class 3D printers um, or hobbyist printers, the whole, whole shebang. Um, and what I'm talking about is our brand new software capability, um, which started May 2017, so about 20 months ago, um, where they brought me in from zero software capability to a product that comes out of stealth Monday. Yeah? So this is good timing. Um, I will try and get you a link, um, or at least a screenshot of our actual product um, before it goes. If I'm not really talking about 3D printing, you'll just find some obscure references to 3D printing. Um, I'm also happy to talk about that in questions. Um, today, rather than being John, I am Captain No Crunt. Um, this is me sailing on a very small boat. Um, basically, I said very clearly at the beginning of the project, I'm not going to crunch my team. That's not really relevant to the tools, but I think it's an important thing to say um, that we've gone from, with a small team, from nothing to a product with no points of crunch. No one's worked other than me more than 40 hours a week. And that's only because I wanted to, really. Um, cool. So, I have a little warning in case you're not expecting lots of analogies and bad puns and C++ and C references. Um, they're quite a lot. So many, in fact, that I'm going to push the analogical boat right out as far as the analogies go and sail a little close to the wind. Yeah, so you've got the idea where we're going. Um, Cool. So where do we start? We started at a beach of sand in the middle of nowhere. We had nothing. There's not much on this beach. Fortunately, we could see the floating lab of Git. Um, I.e., we established right at the beginning before we started that we were going to use GitLab as our version control and our project management, or some of our project management. Um, there are other tools. Um, you'll find this throughout the talk. There are other other tools. I'm not necessarily endorsing these above any others. Um, you'll find some common structure as we go forwards. And who were we? We were three people. So subject to the other company building hardware and their directorship and their engineers doing hardware stuff, we were three software people. Myself, previous to this, I was an academic doing games, 3D graphics, and a whole bunch of user experience, crazy interactive style art stuff. Um, a recent games graduate, like 21, 22, and an ex-army mathematician, a bit older, but basically no shipping experience. I'm really happy that we're going to ship something, um, because up until this point, I've never shipped a product. Yeah? I've shipped lots of prototypes, and my academic job was making lots of small things and showing them off, but that's kind of different to products. Um, so that's the other theme that comes through here is, and I'm sure everyone in here knows what goes into a product. Um, but I think that's where C++ gets, and all languages, this gets really more difficult. Um, when we talk about products, there's a whole bunch more thing than just the C++ stuff and how those interact. 
And so where do we want to get to? We want to obviously get to the land of product shipping. Um, we want to ship some ships. Because our analogy, the analogy I'm working with here, ships are programs, yeah? That's what you ship. You ship a program or an app or whatever thing you want to call it. Maybe you ship a website or a web service. Um, so we're trying to ship ships. So we're more like a dockyard or a shipyard, if you like. Um, here's a lovely picture. And in the 3D world, this gets a bit more entertaining um, because we're shipping software to help people run their printers and they print things on their printers. And the model I've passed around is sort of one of the 3D model, 3D printer benchmark models. So when people get our new product or existing products with their 3D printer, they're going to print little ships. Yeah, so we're building a ship building ship builder ship. You may know some of this, what's coming. This is a ship, shipping ship, shipping ship ships. Yeah, I'll give that for you a moment just to figure out what the hell's going on in this. There's like two of these in the world. I think that's just quite cool. Um, but I guess the analogy here does hold up that our jobs are quite a long way back from driving a boat, driving a ship, running a program. Um, and a lot of the time when we're doing tool stuff, and I was lucky enough to talk to one of the Conan people just before, they're building tools to help us build tools, to build tools, to eventually someone does something useful with the world. Um, I find that really interesting. So before we get into the real guts of what we're going on here, so I said we knew to start with we're using Git and GitLab. Um, that was one constraint, the constraint that we chose. The other constraint that we didn't choose so much was who are we shipping our ships to? Um, this guy, this is, a, this, this is some sailor, Wikipedia sailor. Um, no, so one of the groups of sailors that we want to ship to are sailors who like to smell and sail in these really small areas where the climate is nice and gentle and where you can look outside. Anyone know what these sailors are like? Microsoft Windows. Yay! Um, so Windows was one of our targets. You can probably guess where the next ones are going. These people like to wear Southwesters all the time. Southwesters is another name for Macintosh users. So, and finally, we want to ship to the Antarctic, yeah? Or people who like to go to the Antarctic and look at the penguins. Linux users. This wasn't an accidental constraint. But we did know at the beginning that this was a constraint, that we were going to be building ships, meta analogy-wise, um, be cross-platform from day one. And that's one of the big things that's feeding into the tools we're looking at, that having built things not cross-platform to start with, it's very difficult to change afterwards. I don't know if anyone has any experience of trying to port something that was just written for Windows to anything else or vice versa. I should note, we also did consider shipping to other places, sort of pure web, web as a front end um, kind of targets. That's just a business decision not to right now. Um, we aren't constrained to not do that currently. So with this voyage, the new company, E3D Skunkworks, is entirely funded by the existing company. So we're tiny and we're on pretty tight budgets. We're not Ableton. That would be nice. Um, we currently have three C++ devs plus me and three other people doing dev work and so on things. So we're really small. Um, and to start with, we were literally just three people. So obviously we wanted to start off with, I want to build my first ship. I want to build my first app. Um, this is really familiar to me. My previous job as an academic, not just doing research, is was teaching people about C++ and programming and doing that. And my first program in C++, anyone done that from scratch? Everyone's done that from scratch, right? As soon as it gets a little bit difficult, Hello World becomes really difficult. The learning curve there is quite difficult. So that was sort of our first goal. Our second goal was 
as far as the product went, our ship was designed to do some things different from the competition. Um, within 3D printing, we're trying to do some more 3D stuff. Um, so we're starting off, we're an R&D-led company doing proof of concept. Um, so everything we were doing to start with was proof of concept, but with in mind that we're going to have to take this proof of concept if it proves the concept to a product. That's where we started with. And we obviously wanted a ship that doesn't sink too often. The actual product we're doing is a 3D slicer. If, you, if you're into 3D printing, you probably already know what that means. It's a piece of software that loads up a 3D model of a ship and figures out where shall I spit out plastic and when and how much to generate that model. And not screw it up too often. Um, so we want to make sure the app works most of the time. And we wanted it to be usable. We want to be able to control the ship. People be able to control their, their app, their, their ship. And we chose to do that. Eventually, we'll come to with JavaScript. Whether that was a good decision, we, should, we, we may re revisit if we have time. Um, and one of the other big things we wanted to understand um, is what are people doing with our ships? They're sailing around on the sea. Are they having a nice time? Uh, do they keep crashing into icebergs? Um, does it sink? I'm trying to understand that stuff. So going back to where we were to start with, we were here. We didn't have any, we had made no choices about our dev environment yet, except the constraints that we had. Basically, cross-platform. And we knew we needed performance, um, which would be the choice for C++. We did toy with doing not C++ first, um, but we very rapidly, in the pre-planning stages, understood that C++ we needed for performance because we were doing a lot of computational geometry. Um, and so as it happened, um, I guess we were starting give or take seven, eight months after this, um, 10 months after this. Um, first two weeks I was remote. I was still doing my other job. So I was sort of directing the other two people saying, we need to get off the ground. We need to do something. And Arne, who is here, we say thank you. Um, we literally followed these instructions to get, to get up a build system, get things working, be able for people to work. Um, and that was really nice. So to summarize, um, probably very badly, um, Arne's post, it's, um, which he tells me was a bit tongue in cheek, not very serious. Um, but I think this is a really serious topic of how do you get your people to have the right tools to be able to work efficiently? And some further questions around line. Um, and these are some really core, t core tools. Um, I need a compiler. That's one of the C's. I need to figure out how my, to tell my compiler what to do in a nice cross-platform way. So we've got Clang, we've got CMake, we've got CLion as an IDE. Um, and finally, we have Conan um, to help um, manage libraries. And we knew we were going to use libraries. Um, so this was nice. I hadn't used this exact development environment before, um, but I had used Conan and I had used CMake. Um, I had never used Clang at that point, sadly. Um, nor had I used C-Line, though I'd watched my students use C-Line. Um, so that was really nice. So I want to go through each of these, and basically I'm going to go through this twice, one of which talk about what each of these things do, and then we sort of got some positive negatives and where these tools are going and what it means, and then eventually I have some conclusions. So quick hands up, who has heard of CMake? Every single person, excellent. Who uses CMake day to day? Cool. Who loves CMake day to day? <laughs> so maybe we'll come to that. Um, so you all know what CMake does. It's a build system builder. Um, you somehow define what your project is, what the targets are, how they relate to each other. Um, and it goes up and makes a build system for whatever build system you choose whether you're on Visual Studio of certain sets of versions, whether you're on Xcode, whether you use Makefiles. Yeah, all of these things. 
most people using CMake for cross-platform work or just because it's quite nice compared to other configuration? Is everyone doing cross-platform work in here? Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so we'll come back to, to so Clang. Interestingly, there doesn't appear to be a Clang specific logo I've discovered. So this is the LLVM logo. Clang is a compiler, um, as I'm sure you all know. Um, the nice thing about Clang is that it pretends to be GCC in quite a lot of ways. And that's one of the themes we're going to get to at the end of switching Clang for GCC works quite well. In fact, we rapidly had to do that um, because one of our libraries that we wanted doesn't compile with Clang. It does now, a year and a half later. Um, but at that point, we spent three, four, maybe six weeks with Clang, and then we started trying to bring in one of our libraries that we knew we wanted. It doesn't play nice with Clang. The other fun thing about Clang, has anyone used Clang on a Mac? Yeah? Anyone had fun doing that? Or serious not fun? Um, Apple Clang is what you get on a Mac, unless you can work around it. And Apple Clang really pretends to be GCC, as in it lies um, and screws up CMake specifically um, for us. So that was one aspect. Any other one, any other concerns people have with Apple Clang, apart from um, Apple messing with it? It lags quite a long way behind Clang. Um, so what we found to start off with, it was 2017. So we went, yeah, let's do C++ 17. Yeah, not, not then on Apple Clang, um, which does connect with some of the stuff that um, Tony was talking about in the previous talk in here around backporting features from newer standards to older standards. We had to do that manually. Fortunately, we were only using a few C++ features, mainly file system. Um, but obviously we had then to backport those or hack around, do some fun hash define work um, to allow Apple Clang to build it. Eventually we bailed out on Mac um, and installed GCC on the Mac and just ignored Apple Clang and just kicked it into submission. So C Lion, um, yet another IDE. It works really well for us. There are many other IDEs. There are alternatives, all these things. Um, I really have learned to like C Lion. The last time I'd used an, an in sort of IdeaJ type project was like 15 years ago, right at the beginning, um, much earlier on. And that was quite difficult. Um, but it's um, to work out for C Lion has worked really nicely for us. Um, I'll explore that in a little bit more of a breakdown. The final one is Conan, which is one of the relatively new pa package managers for C++. I guess new is not, there weren't many, there weren't any C++ packages managers until recently. Um, and as far as value for us, Conan has been the single biggest thing um, that it works, works really consistently. It does manages all the different profiles. And it's really understandable by our dev teams about what's going on. Our dev teams, I talk as if there's, um, it's very clear what Conan is doing and when it's doing it. Um, and other package managers that we've looked at, obviously there's, um, I haven't found those so nice. We have spent some time exploring those. Um, but Conan has worked really well for us. So those are sort of the four, first, first three. I thought I might, before we move into what we added onto this kind of stuff, do some uh, pros and cons of, of these. So CMake in some ways is amazing, yeah? It does an awful lot of stuff and it does it consistently well and targets all these different platforms. That may not sound like, like I wrote here, it works. That's a big thing, um, because if CMake breaks, our build is broken, everything's a nightmare. Um, and what I really like about it now is CMake is also well supported on Visual Studio. So the 
last two versions, last three versions of Visual Studio support CMake projects out of the box. You don't have to run CMake to build a target for Visual Studio. Visual Studio magically figures that out. Um, what about the, the less good side? Um, the syntax is really tough. That there are, it costs us humans a lot of time to get CMake to do the right thing. When you read through the code, it's really difficult to understand what's going on, and it's super easy to make mistakes. Yeah? Does anyone disagree with that? Is that probably the frustration that most people have with CMake? Yeah? Yeah? Does anyone have other big frustrations with CMake? That's just it. Just the syntax and the front end. Um, I think that's one of my conclusions I'll come to. So the, the syntax is hard. It's really difficult to follow. Gives a really high learning curve. Even once you've learned it, it's, it's pretty tough to read. Um, the other negative I have is there is no debugger. Yeah, you can't step through CMake. Unless someone can correct me and tell me there is a way to step, step through CMake. Um, does anyone else know about the debugger for CMake? Cool. So there is something, it's just not very up to date. So, okay. Um, which probably comes on to one of the other negatives. Um, I have all the respect for the people who've written CMake. I think they're now just building on a legacy system. Um, but the documentation for CMake, like all these things, they've done a lot of work to make CMake better and CMake targets and all this great stuff but you Google stuff and you find all the old stuff. Um, and it's very difficult to disable that kind of stuff. Um, so the deprecation path is quite difficult. I would, on the other hand, like to go back to the positives. The front end of CMake, difficult. The back end, and having read um, some stuff more recently, there is a good separation there. The back end seems to work really well. Um, I don't know what the, quote, intermediate representation for CMake is or looks like, um, but I would be tempted in the spare time that I don't have um, to write a different front end for CMake in a real programming language um, where you get all those features. Are there other options to CMake? Dozens of them, apart from not using a build system builder and just using Visual Studio packages. Um, solutions or whatever, just writing your own make files. People here writing your own make files very much? No one in here writes their own make files. Excellent. Um, I mean, it's a good thing to be able to do, I suppose. Um, but there are, there are a bunch of other, other things. Previously to CMake, I was using PreMake quite a lot, um, which is like cut down, written in Lua. So the programming, like the front end is quite nice, the back end has much less um, scalability. I think the other bit the CMake struggles with is it does a lot of different things. Pre-build events, post-build events, arbitrary commands that you can run whenever you like. It's got two internal stages of configure and build. It's not clear to people where those are going on. Which raises the question, what is the future for CMake? I'm not going to promise to build a new front end for CMake. Um, I just hope that someone will, um, or it will disappear. Um, there's probably other ways to do it. Um, so maybe we'll come back to the future of this bit in a little bit. So, Clang specifically, I'm out of order with my things. I've covered some of this already. Clang itself works great. Really nice error messages. Um, Really fast, really effective. Um, yes, it works. That's my biggest thing. I have very little more positive to say about Clang other than it's really, really good. Um, and my negatives are more about Apple Clang. Um, but that said, that's because we've been mostly spending the last 12 months um, tied onto GCC. Um, 
So I can't expect talk about the Clang much because I haven't used Clang very much recently. Um, I'm hoping in the next few weeks um, that we can migrate over to Clang and get some new, new features out. So I can't really answer the other bit. Sea Lion, really great. One of the nicest things I like about Sea Lion is that C lines a C++ IDE, but it doesn't care if you've got other things in your project and it really supports those really well. So if you happen to have Python or JavaScript or Bash or all the crazy stuff that you end up in, in your project, C line still lets you deal with those, still gives you syntax highlighting, still will let you run things. Um, their velocity is also really good. The, the, fe the features coming out, I really like. Um, so that's the positives. Do I have any downsides as far as C-Line goes? Oh, I pressed hide. Two very minor ones. Mainly, it's con currently constrained using make underneath um, rather than the Ninja. Um, and we notice significant um, speed, compilation speed differences for that. Um, that's a pretty minor nitpick. There is some dubious hacking you can do around to make it work with Ninja, um, but that looks too scary to, to be sustainable um, for what we were doing. Um, the other bit, and I'm sure this is much more my understanding, um, because we're using CMake, making new CMake targets is really nice. They appear in um, they appear in C line. Great. Within C line, I can make other other kinds of targets for different languages. So I previously mentioned JavaScript front end. Um, I could make targets there and build them in there, but that's not in CMake. Because CMake is a C++ thing. Um, but it would be nice to be able to unify those somehow without tying it to CLion. So there's, a, there's a quite a tight coupling there between some of the types of projects or things you want to talk about for your build system um, and some of them are tied to the build system. CMake breaks that separation for C++ projects. You can define the kind of things you want, the kind of targets you want, how to build them in CMake, give them to other tools. I think you probably all know the other options, many of the other options compared to CLine. Um, we use Visual Studio day in, day out as well. Um, obviously exclusively on Windows, um, not because C line doesn't work on Windows. It works just as well on Windows. Setting up non-Visual Studio, uh, non-VC compiler on, on Windows when we first tried it was a bit fiddly. The only reason we're using Visual Studio is we want the different compiler and it's got different debug tools. So that's sort of my conclusion there. I think the, the future for C line is very positive. I don't know what it, <laughs> the actual JetBrains people here um, want to say, but um, for us, we're going to keep using C-Line. Um, it's an excellent tool. And going back to Conan, as I said, Conan works really well. Works all the time. Their velocity is really good. The velocity of new features that you actually want, um, listening to the community, the fact that the packages, just out of curiosity, how many people here have been using Conan significantly professionally or just at all? Yeah, a little bit. Um, people using other package managers? Which ones? I'm just curious. VC package? Yeah. So, yeah, Conan works great. It's, it's really consistent. Um, it matches on to not building stuff that doesn't link, um, which, which we found really important. Um, most importantly, as our team is small and significantly junior, it's also really clear what's going on. You can look at the YAML file or you can look at a Python file. That it, it's really easy to follow. Um, none of, while my team may not have experience in Python necessarily, they can follow the Python code really clearly. Following CMake code, that's a that's that's not the same thing. Um, 
So the, the negatives with Conan, if, if there are any. Um, Conan's relationship with CMake is interesting because they're both trying to say, what kind of thing are you targeting? What's, the, what's uh, at any one time? They both have this idea of profiles, which you can use or not use. Um, and there's a, a frequent question of who's in charge. Does C line make the decisions based on C line's profile? Sorry, not C line. Does Conan make the decision based on the Conan profile and somehow tell that to CMake? Or does CMake decisions based on a CMake profile and somehow tell that to Conan? We've gone with the latter form. So CMake tells Conan what to do, um, mainly because it meant we had to do one less thing. Um, the, we just run the CMake file, CMake goes off, does the Conan stuff, comes back, we're happy. Um, as opposed to if Conan hasn't been run and you try and build, do the CMake stuff, it goes, ah, Conan's not been run and says Conan's not been run. That's not, that's not a terrible thing. Um, but I, I found for, for me on my own working on it and for my team saying the same thing, it's just so easy to forget. Oh, I didn't run Conan, so everything's out of sync. Um, Going down one more. Other options, VC package came up. Last time I checked, VC package was tied to Windows only, but I think that's what loosened up now, is that right? The other constraint I, consideration I had with VC package was it's only a curated list. And what we do like, have liked about Conan is I can make my own packages, yeah? I can put my packages on a private store if you're worried about security or, or speed or whatever. Um, those are really nice features. There are about six other ones as well. Um, but yeah. Future of Conan, I think I want to come back to the future of Conan um, in my tying up points towards the end. So what else did we start adding in? So at this point, we had a dev environment. We could build some stuff, yeah? We wanted to add some unit testing. Um, 3D printing is relatively safe as far as it goes. If we plan it wrong, the printers don't often catch fire, but they can catch fire. You can physically break someone's printer. So it's not unit testing entirely just for unit testing sake for making your software better. It has also a little bit of a safety critical aspect as far as we're concerned of if we're doing the right thing, wrong thing, and we break someone's printer, they'd be pretty unhappy. Probably more unhappy if we burn their house down. Um, but also, much less seriously, not this one so much, this is kind of a special thing, but your, your random thing, if that takes two hours to print, and the software is wrong, the halfway through it screws up, and you're obviously out of the pub or gone somewhere else while it's printing, you don't watch it, it's wasted your time and it's probably weighted your plastic. Um, so we want to try and make sure as much as possible that we are printing the right thing. So we started using Catch2. We looked at a bunch of other unit testing libraries. Catch2 Catch has worked really well for us. I've lost my page. Um, Catch2 also ships with um, another product called Clara, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, it lets us write our unit tests really easily. You can decide which way you want to write them. Um, you can just write tests. You can follow um, behavior-driven um, development kind of style, BDD, which is what we tend to be doing. That's made it so that our intern developers, which we had last summer, who had even less development experience, they could write tests for us because they could write the words saying, in this situation, when this happens, this should be the real world. This should be the case, um, which Catch makes it really easy to write. And then they could go through and fill in the C++, which does each of those actions. Um, so generally, I've, I've liked Catch 2 really very much. The other nice things about it is the output from it, you can control which kind of output you get. If you have a system that consumes J, J units XML, you can get it from Catch2. Um, that kind of flexibility of, this is a tool that does one thing, 
but it gives its output or its input is in a way that plays nice with other people, other programs. That that's really a positive thing, um, and that's one of my conclusive points here: is that tools which play nice with other tools are much easier. They don't constrain you in the same way. Um, do I have any downsides for Catch Two? I have one, which is not really about Catch Two. It's more about um, template metaprogramming. Is that our compile times with tests off and tests on is a 10x difference, um, and we don't have that many tests. Um, and I don't think that's because Phil's written a really bad um, set of template meta, meta programming. I think it's just the nature of um, compilers doing the templating. Um, but so that does have a cost to us, but we're, re we're pretty happy with that. Um, other options to, to catch? Hundreds. Um, we looked at C-Test for a while, is that play nice with CMake? Um, Catch actually can tie in with CMake and output output what will CMake will believe a CMake test, uh, C test. Um, we did that for a while and then didn't find it very useful. So we just sat back with with Catch 2 for itself. Um, so a couple of future things um, or things which have been happened very recently in Catch 2. One of which is so currently we do some tests on actual models. We have some really boring tests which go load this model. Check it loads and nothing crashes, yeah? The moment that's some horrible for loop, um, rather than catch now allowing us to say, run this test according to all these different conditions in some, some list or in a matrix. Um, that's a really nice feature um, that we've liked. Catch, in case you haven't used it before, um, also comes with a separate library which Phil's called Clara, which is a command line processing tool, um, giving you options, option flags and stuff. That just made me happy. Um, I think that's, again, there's, man, there's many other options um, to this. Um, Clara just works, it's really easy to define your things. You define your options and then you automatically get help. So you can type dash dash help and it does, some, does all those things. Um, it also supports, and this is something which um, is a separate problem which is encouraging, um, command line flag dash lib identify um, for a program to consistently, every program ideally, take this command line flag and report back saying, hey, yeah, this is who I am, and this is my version, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and Clara lets that make, makes that really easy. Uh, that's most of the reason I brought it up, other than just if you're interested in doing command line stuff, Clara's kind of cool. So, C cache, another C. Slow compile times, yeah, big, big challenge. Um, C cache is one of two big tools that we've been trying to do to speed up our, our build times. Um, our Visual Studio build time is not quite so bad as our GCC build time. Um, for reasons which I don't fully understand. Um, but Ccache, working only as it happens um, on non-Windows, caches the compiler, compiler commands and gives them back. And this has made a really big difference to our um, both our developer build time and what we'll come to in a moment, our CI build time. Um, but Ccache works really well. Does anyone here use Ccache as part of their day to day? Cool. So I feel like I'm preaching to the converted here. Um, so it works really nicely. You just basically put Ccache at the front of your normal commands. It ties well into CMake. CMake has support for Ccache, um, which is nice. So you don't have to do loads of configuration. You just have to have it already installed. So while we're talking about Zcash, the other thing we did here, because we were trying to build our ships faster, um, was to use a Mozilla tool called ICC. Does anyone here use ICC or come across ICC? 
So ICC is a distributed compiler. Um, also plays nice with Ccache sometimes. Um, this meant that rather than building on our relatively cheap workstations, um, as one, we could distribute the compiling over more workstations and over our um, CI servers. So we could go from building, if you're using make, across four cores or whatever, to 24 or 48 cores. That makes a huge difference. Um, of course, ICC doesn't work on Windows, which is sad. Um, and it also doesn't paralyze linking, which is the bit that for us is now our biggest cost. Compiling is relatively quick, but the actual linking stage, um, and if anyone has any ideas how to reduce linking other than just using Goldlinker, um, that would be really useful to me. Um, but but link, linking is, is an existing challenge. Downsides of Ccache, none at all, except it doesn't work on Windows, which does bring us to other options. <coughs> Most recently, um, Scache, which is another Mozilla project, which is basically a clone of Ccache, but cross-platform and storing your cache results in an S3-like storage container. It's not necessarily on S3, so you can do some kind of local S3 clone or, or just local storage so that you have a shared cache. And that's that, well, we haven't moved to S cache yet. Um, that's on our books for the next, next few months um, because we have problems with making sure that the cache is warm as much as possible. Um, on Windows, you've got IncrediBuild. People here using IncrediBuild, anyone? Yeah? And we'd like to use Incredible, it's just really expensive um, for us, we, we found. Um, I think most recently I've been, try I've been following the Fast Build project, which is an open source um, uh, cross-platform distributed build tool um, that has great um, evidence that it works well. Um, but we haven't tried it because it doesn't play with, CCAT, with CMake. So we'd have to rewrite all our build scripts for fast build, and that's 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 the only reason that we haven't tried it, um, and that's so maybe we will buy to build a CMake to fast build um, output. Who knows? So the impacts of using Ccache combined with ICC for our project we're sort of twenty twenty five thousand lines of C plus um, plus. Quite a lot of template stuff in there. Our build times have gone down from on a clean CI machine, four cores, not not super duper machines, um, from and building all the code and stuff um, from towards an hour down to towards five minutes. Um, if we clean out the cache and our cache is cold, um, don't do the distributed build, we start crawling right back up towards half an hour, towards an hour. Um, so this, this has made a huge difference for us. Which brings me to the last one of our Cs, for now at least, um, which is continuous integration. Um, in our case, we've been using the continu in continuous integration that comes with GitLab. Um, this has worked really well. Um, not only does it GitLab CI play well with the rest of GitLab and the sort of philosophies in GitLab, um, which I and our team happen to sort of agree with. Um, it also builds artifacts, does all our deployment for us. So not only are we getting feedback about um, does it compile, does it lint, all that kind of stuff. Um, I would ask, is everyone here using CI in some form or another? Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a lifesaver for us. Uh, it's also a time saver. We had about a month where we weren't bothering with the Windows CI because we were only three developers and no one was on Windows uh, for a month. When we came back from that month, we spent two weeks on and off fixing the Windows build because it hadn't been running. Um, and so we didn't get the quick feedback. All the fixes, if we'd noticed them at the time, would have been super quick. Um, the challenges with CI we found are 
cache related um, that GitLab CI and Travis and all the other ones which I, uh, will come on when we list them do a really good job with caching and allowing to serve caching. Um, GitLab CI currently, this is its, its negative. Um, its cache is a zip file um, that it compresses and decompresses on one core. Even if it's locally on the machine, it will write out a zip on one core and then it will decompress the zip on one core. So we've bypassed that and not using GitLab's, GitLab CI's cache. We just share a file into the Docker container, um, which works fine. But then we've lost the power of GitLab in the UI being able to say, I clear all the caches. Because it can't do that anymore because we don't use its cache. So we have to go and either write some scripts or connect to all the machines and clear the caches manually. Um, that's an open ticket. Um, that I, in fact, that is what I'm happy to work on with, with GitLab. I just haven't got a direction from them about how they think they should do it. Um, other CI options, I'm sure there's lots of internal ones. I know Microsoft have one, I just don't remember the name of it at the moment. Um, but sort of Travis, Circle CI, App there. Um, all of these um, do varying degrees of free CI for open source projects, um, which is really great. Um, and varying, varying degrees of um, free CI for closed source projects. Um, what we've liked about GitLab CI is that we can run it on our own on our own runners, and it's worked out more economical for us to have physical infrastructure um, on our site um, for that. Um, anything else I want to say? So who in here has been working with the CI as in configuring the CI and trying to write new CI scripts and understand what's going on there? Everyone, has anyone had fun doing that? Yeah? Um, I can't speak for the other ones, but the, the biggest challenge we've had with CI is that you have to commit stuff to CI and wait for it to run through the pipeline to do any debugging. Um, and that's been a real challenge. Um, and even though the CI, CI is running on Docker, GitLab at the moment, I can't speak for the others. It's like it's in Docker, I should be able to run this locally. And I can, I can run one of the jobs in the pipeline locally, but obviously we have a pipeline chain of however many jobs. And currently there's no, no immediate support for doing that locally and understanding what's going on. So the, I think the last bit I'm gonna talk about this can connect nicely to our shipping analogy. Obviously a ship has a log. Um, anyone know what happens to a ship when it sinks? The log goes with it, yeah? In our analogy, that holds true as well. You've got product out on some, some user's computer. Yeah, yeah, I've been logging all this nice stuff. It's still there. Um, and this is, I think the logging stuff is what surprised me most about going to production. Um, everything says you should log stuff, log the right stuff at the right time, all that kind of kind of stuff. Speed log is a great logging library. It's really fast, does all the things you can do formatting, builds on lib format. Um, so you can decide how your output is, you can send output to different files and all, all the things you want to possibly do with a logger. Um, except that it tends to just target logs on the local machine. Um, is what they say. It is very, very quick. That's never been our problem with speed log. Um, the challenge I've had with speed log is how do we get those logs off the system? That we live in the 21st century and it would be nice to get logging um, off the system fast um, so that we can understand that going back to sort of our early goals, we want to understand what the system is doing on dev machines and on production machines for users. Um, and just logging locally doesn't let us do that. So we've had to do quite a lot of work with different stacks to try and get logs um, off board. There is loads of support of this recently within container land. Um, sort of the 
um, Elasticsearch kind of um, libraries to get logs from some container, put them on a server so you can analyze them, understand what's going on. There's much less of that with just on, at the app level um, that I'm aware of. Um, so the other frustration I've had, and this isn't really with speed log, this is with logging in general, is we lose loads of the information. Um, we turn structured data, C++, into a string. And one string that something else somewhere else now has to go and parse that string to understand what was going on. Um, and so perhaps logging is not the right, the right word, the right term for what we're trying to do. And um, we're trying to observe the system, yeah? We want to know what's going on. We want to know where it happened, when it happened. Um, and those are big challenges. The other thing we want to be able to do is detect crashes. This is the same, much the same thing as logging or observability. When something crashes, how do we detect it? This was probably the least fun bit of development we've been doing that we solve. Turned out that Electron, which is what we're using for our front end, forgive me, um, Electron is a, a node browser hybrid JavaScript thing. Turns out the Electron can grab all the crashes on all the platforms for us. Building Breakpad and Crashpad has been really difficult um, for all the different platforms. Um, I forget which exactly one of these claims that it builds for Windows. It's a Google product. It's a Google product, it's a Google, Google library. It does not have the code um, that builds for Windows. So it definitely doesn't work. But so we've got through that. I think the nice thing about this is that we, do, we are using, we're using a, a product called Backtrace. Um, it's a web service. If you listen to CPCast, you've probably heard the ads for it, which lets either of these tools, when something crashes, send the report up to a web service. And there are other web services that do that also. And th th this, is, this has been really useful for us. So when a crash happens, we're getting the, re getting the reports. Um, none of this is particularly exciting, um, but having this observability lets us know what, when, when a crash happens, what has gone on. And that's made us pretty happy. Um, we spent some time trying to do some anti-piracy stuff. I'm sorry, that one didn't show up very well. Um, neither does this. Um, this is a third party binary we're using. It's built by the third party, it's closed source. Um, we're bringing it in through a Git submodule, but we'd like to bring it in through Conan, and that's only a matter of time that we haven't done that. Um, I don't really have any much, many points around around anti piracy. Um, ideally, we would be open source, but um, we're not. So this is where I really wanted to get to. These are sort of the, the main points are saying. From both the teaching side and um, in in industry, we're frequently creating new new apps, new packages, new libraries. Yeah, but many of the things in these libraries that we want are very very similar, um, and there are a lot of things. This is some of the tooling that we have. Um, there's a, about twenty more pages of other tooling that we have in. I'm sure all your products have a similar amount of. Huge amounts of separate tools. So what do you do when you want to make a new project? Do you just copy and paste an old one, delete the code, keep the setup? Has anyone done that? Yeah? Does that seem like a good idea? This is the bit that worries me most about it. If that builds the, all the setup that you have already was built two years ago, three years ago, and you just copy and paste, You've kept the legacy code when you had no reason to. Not the legacy C++ necessarily, but the legacy build system um, aspects. And perhaps you also don't understand what you've done. Um, you've just got some stuff. I think the other bit that I'm, I found, even within our small thing where we have basically like three libraries, um, is it just, just it discourages us from building smaller libraries. Because getting to the point of, I have a thing that I can build that is going to be, have all the tools that I want for a production 
tool slash library thing is non-trivial. So we don't do it so much. If we made a comparison to other languages, say React and JS, React comes out with this, I'm not necessarily endorsing React, um, but it comes out with this thing with React Create App. You type one command and it makes you a new project that uses their current best practices. And while you stay within that, it will also update all those things to the new best practices and the new libraries. That's really nice. That's why I, I would love that in C++. Do other people like that in C++? So no, make new awesome C++ app. Maybe. Um, the other bit that we've been find, I've been finding with other languages, um, specifically the JS type languages, is that you can automate other tasks in the same tool set that you are used to. Um, so Yarn or NPM in JavaScript world, not only do they let you install packages um, and add new packages to install and keep track of them, and they also let you do arbitrary other stuff. Maybe they're doing two things at once. This is what I can't decide. Should your package manager also be run other scripts for me? CMake's not a package manager and it does do those things. It lets you do other arbitrary stuff. Should, we, should those be more separate? Should they be more tied together? I'm not sure. We've got a whole other alternative stream to Conan um, in the Python world with the Anaconda project and the Conda projects, which are trying to set up new dev environments for Python developers or C++ developers. So you can build a C++ project through Anaconda um, or Java, Gradle and all that kind of stuff. I think there's a really big challenge here. We all have the, all, some version of all these tools, yeah? In the products that we're shipping, whether they are these tools um, is a different question, but we have all these tools and there's a huge learning curve with all these. You bring on a new developer, and what logging system are you using? What logging format are you using? Where does the information go? How do you understand that data? Um, how do you configure the build system? What are all the little gotchas? Um, new tools come out. I think this is this is tough on all developers. It's especially difficult on newer um, developers. Perhaps more experienced developers is also difficult because you've got more change to do. Um, and from my very direct experience with students. C++ is quite a challenging enough thing to learn. Learning all the tooling that goes with um, any language, and especially C++, is, is hard. Um, I think that's really difficult. So my last conclusion point is, the favorite thing I have about the tools I've talked about is those that play nicely with each other. It's very easy to switch GCC for Clang. There's some bits where you have to be careful, but they're reasonably easy to switch. It's not very easy to switch GCC and Visual Studio, except that CMake lets you abstract that most of the time. It's really difficult to change your CI system, unless you write everything that the CI basically goes, do this, call some other script. In our case, Python scripts. That also helps us do things lo locally. Um, and as we start talking about other languages and tools, the other big question here, not only having nice interfaces that play, thing, play nice, so for instance, Catch2 will export its stuff as JSON. Whether you like or hate JSON is up to you, um, but you can consume it in, a form, in another form, and you can control the tools which have input that you can configure nicely, output that you can configure nicely, play nice with each other. That, that really helps um, working with them. As we hit other languages, um, we, so we have this JavaScript layer. Um, one of the talks um, yesterday around um, the various stacks, converting. If we're converting our APIs, how do we um, define the API between different languages, different versions? How do we share data between different languages and versions? And how do we keep that up to date? How do we manage? Oh, I've got got a model, a thing uh, in C++, that's probably a class, represents something, but I want to also be able to do stuff with that in JavaScript or, J or Java or Python or whatever. That's a really difficult problem. Um, that's not what this talk about. Um, we're out of time, so um, I'm going to stop. Don't have any questions.
put this right back in the middle. Cool, no questions. Thanks everyone.